This is Vicki Armour Heilman, and this is my philosophy of technology in the writing classroom. I teach first year composition, and originally I was skeptical about expanding the curriculum to teach digital literacy. I mean, sure, students need to know how to use the library's online portal to find scholarly articles, but beyond that, don't we have enough on our plates? Besides, when I was in college, I typed my essays, as in, on a typewriter. Am I really the right person to teach digital anything, particularly to students born in the digital age? But then I listened to a great series of podcasts by Jennifer Bowie in which she argues that digital technology, such as podcasts, can help students understand rhetorical principles that were already part of the first year composition curriculum. And it hit me what if digital literacy isn't an extra in an already overly full curriculum? What if it's actually the most effective and efficient way of teaching what's already on the syllabus? As a case in point, let's take Bowie's suggestion of audio assignments, and let's start with an assignment some of my students experimented with this last semester, the Pecha Kucha. Pecha Kucha, sometimes pronounced Pachachka in English, is a Japanese word meaning chatter. The form requires 20 visual slides, each shown for 20 seconds. Some students experimented with this form in my class this past year, producing a multimodal presentation and a transcript. Students discovered that to do the project well, they needed to rehearse the audio several times, revising as they went. To my delight, this process of rehearsing and revising taught them a lot about writing processes and taught them more about revision than anything else I could do with them. As an added bonus, it interrupted their tendency to wait to the last minute to write, a habit that I unfortunately remember well from my own misspent youth. Not so surprisingly, as they produced multiple drafts, their writing improved. Gone was the tortured syntax, the thesaurus-inspired morass of wrong words that composition scholar Ken McCrory calls ingfish. In their place emerged clear, clean, concise prose. Not only that, but by reading and revising their draft multiple times, several students also had fewer than usual surface errors. In addition to all these benefits, Bowie argues that audio projects such as these allow us to teach a particularly full understanding of rhetoric, including the canon of delivery, which has largely been omitted from composition classrooms for decades because there was no need for it when student work was limited to static texts on a page or a computer screen. But that's not all. Bowie joins other scholars in suggesting that working with audio can give students a visceral understanding of audience. I would add that other digital modalities are also helpful in understanding audience. For example, blogs and wikis can create a community of writers within the classroom, providing peer feedback on work and giving students a taste of what it means to connect to an audience beyond the teacher. To recap then, as we can see from these examples, multimedia digital composition adds several important elements to student learning. Grounded in the oral roots of rhetoric, new media assignments can help students gain a fuller understanding of rhetoric, can give them an immediate sense of audience, and can foster good habits of revision. Now, as much as I value these benefits, one of my main concerns about digital composition is that most of what Deborah Brandt calls self-sponsored writing, the kind of writing students are already doing on their own, seems to me to be scattered and to slide over the surface of subjects. I worried that digital compositions would share that limitation, shortchanging students in the area of critical thinking. But then, one of my students experimented with, a, with creating a hypertext version of Emra Lazarus's The New Colossus. The hyperlinks took the reader to a new page where the student read snippets of the poem out loud and discussed the connections between these excerpts and both historical events and other parts of the poem. 
I think the result was a deeper and more critical analysis, as well as more attention to detail in the text, than she could have achieved with a more conventional, linear reading of the poem. That work pointed out that the right kind of digital assignment can support critical thinking and deep analysis of texts. If we look at all these examples together, it's clear that for me, digital technology in the writing classroom is not about the technology itself or about me trying to teach the millennial generation how to use digital modes of composition. It's about the things I know best, rhetoric, writing processes, critical thinking. And it's about using digital composition when it seems like the best way to learn a particular concept or skill. One final note. As Kathleen Yancey, Charles Tyrone, Elizabeth Clark, and others point out, digital communications are especially suited to expressing broad public concerns to a wide audience, and they can help students develop the skills they will most likely need for life beyond college. This public and civic aspect of digital composition is important because it helps students see a connection between what we do in class and what they do beyond it. And it helps me remember that education is not just about what students are capable of doing in a given assignment. It's about what my course prepares them to be able to do in the world beyond the classroom. Last year, one of my students wrote in her literacy narrative that she hopes to learn to how to shape the world with her words. I think the digital modalities she will learn in my class, combined with the rhetorical principles we explore together, will help her do just that. This is Vicki Armour-Heilman. Thanks for listening.